Welcome back. So we are continuing our survey of American refrigeration. And we started off yesterday with the humble ice box. And this is a, a wooden box that we put food in. We threw some ice in there to keep it cold. And yay, we thought that was refrigeration. Things have changed a lot. And when we come back, we are going to do a slight review, very quick, and then pick up where we left off. So yesterday we started off with the ice box, wooden box, throw in some food, throw in some ice, and there you go, refrigeration. That changed in the 1920s. In fact, uh, the date usually given is 1927, when home refrigeration uh, came into being. Keep in mind that refrigeration machines had been invented. Uh, almost 200 years earlier, but we are talking about home kitchen appliances at this point. Now, this is a 1920s monitor top refrigerator, and a, it's in a steamer trunk. I'm not quite sure what they're trying to do here. I believe what they are trying to suggest is look how small the refrigerator is, because it's certainly not about portability. These things were extremely heavy, and they were not what anyone would, would really consider to be portable. So I suspect it's about the size. And as we go on, do keep that in mind these refrigerators were small. The space available for food in this refrigerator is probably somewhere around six to eight cubic feet. Remember that number. Um, we're, we're just going to take for the sake of argument eight cubic feet. And believe me, grandma was happy to have it. Then we took a look at these gorgeous art deco refrigerators. In my personal opinion, that is when refrigerator styling really peaked. The 1930s, these just, oh, these fabulous refrigerators. This one is unusual in that it ha has a rack on the door. Using the door for storage space was simply not something that occurred to them. And as I mentioned before, uh, and we've talked about this in many other contexts as we look at the development of ideas from the past to the present. People tended to stay very functionally fixed. They stuck with what they were used to. And storage on the door of your kitchen cabinet or your wardrobe or any uh, type of case piece of furniture was not really something they thought about. So it came to the refrigerator as a bit of an afterthought. This refrigerator is probably around the same storage size as the others, maybe 10 cubic feet at most. In this case, the refrigerator storage space is a little more valuable because of that door. By the time we get into the 1940s, things are not changing. Now, I'm just going to flip through these 1940s photos while I talk. These are all 40s refrigerators. Please notice, they have changed very little from that Art Deco refrigerator. They are still white. The doors still open left to right. They are one door with often a storage bin unrefrigerated at the bottom, a little tiny freezer compartment, but the style is still that Art Deco from the 1930s. Now, when you stop and think about this, it's very clear why that 
happened. And that's because in the 1940s, we were at war. The appliance manufacturing companies diverted their production from home appliances over to munitions, to uh, fighter planes, to ship components. And uh, everybody, it, it was a universal war effort. Everybody in the United States geared over for the war and consequently developments in home refrigeration took a serious backseat. And the refrigerators, like this one, this is the end of the 1940s, really had not changed that much from the end of the 1920s. Uh, one of the things we do notice going into the 50s, however, is that our freezer space has expanded a little. Remember in the 1920s, it could hold two or three ice cube trays? Well, you could actually put more into it by the 1950s. Now, this piece is what we would think of as a rather typical 1950s refrigerator. We've lost the deco styling, but we haven't really replaced it with anything. Right now, it is just a white box. As we move further into the 50s, however, we start to see strange innovations. And by the way, most of what you're going to see really didn't last. This one, for example, is an under-counter refrigerator, a mini-fridge in effect. Notice the super tiny freezer area has not changed. We've just integrated that refrigerator into the kitchen cabinets. The top is perfectly level with the rest of the countertop and, you know, your kitchen sink. So, again, that's one that didn't last. Here's another one. 1950s refrigeration mounted on the wall like upper kitchen cabinets. It was more convenient because you didn't have to bend down to get things out of your refrigerator, but still, it was a design innovation that never really caught on. This is a refrigerator that is built into a stove-sink combination. We would look at that and say that's something that came out of a recreational vehicle. No. This was actually something that people had in small apartments, in vacation homes, where pieces like this really took off was in large congested cities like New York, Boston, Philadelphia, where housing was at a premium and people would pay a great deal of money simply for a studio apartment. Well, this little piece was, in effect, your kitchenette. And you could pop that into your apartment, taking up about the same space as, as an armchair would take. Again, this is something that did not catch on with the mainstream, but it certainly did catch on in terms of the fact that you still see pieces like this in the RV industry. Now, notice this refrigerator. We have a family of four here, and this is the refrigerator. Dad is probably about six feet tall, so I am guessing that refrigerator is probably four and a half feet tall at most. Refrigerators were small. What we're looking at here is probably something under 10 cubic feet of storage space. Notice, though, that there is more freezer space than we've seen in the past because freezing started to become a thing. Here's another one. Now, keep in mind that even today, the average American adult female is only 5 feet 4 inches tall. And even if we assume this woman is a model and therefore very, very tall, you can still see what we're looking at is a refrigerator that's topping out at around five feet. The freezer space 
has gotten much larger, much more usable space. Notice we've got three ice cube trays up at the top, but we've actually got room to put more food in there. But nevertheless, keep in mind, at this point, this piece is probably, I'm guessing, about 12 cubic feet of storage. Now, once we get further into the 50s, when we've moved further away from the war, because that was key. Remember, the appliance industry had re-geared for the war when the war was over, even though some of them still did defense contracting. In order to go back to creating appliances, there was a certain lag time. They needed to retool to go back to what they did before. By the way, the government helped to finance that. As I say, the war effort was universal in this country, which I guess was a good thing to come out of war. Also, a lot of technology comes out of war. It's, it's unfortunate to say that, but some of our greatest innovations have come from the military. So what we see now is a refrigerator that is closer to six feet tall, much more space. At this point, we are probably looking at maybe, oh, maybe as much as 20 cubic feet of storage in this refrigerator. Now, mind you, this is an ad. They're going to show you the top of the line piece, but this would have been about the maximum amount one would be getting out of the average refrigerator. This is an unusual piece because if you'll notice, half the space is freezer space. That's simply not the way uh, the industry moved into the future. This would have been a specialty item. Also, this would have been wildly expensive. Here's another one, and this is much more like what we are used to seeing in terms of the breakdown between refrigerator space and freezer space. A refrigerator like this is probably about 15 cubic feet, as you can see, about a third of that is freezer space. Uh, this is the sort of refrigerator you could see today if you got a, a lower freezer, one of those with the freezer on the bottom. If you got one of those today, the interior really wouldn't look all that different from what you see here. But notice, we are starting to get color. Prior to this, our refrigerators have been white. There was a brief flirtation with color in the very late 20s, never took off. And right up through the 1950s, everything was white. Now we're seeing blue. Uh, this is another one. This one is a little more typical in terms of what the average 19... 50s, early 60s refrigerator would have looked like. A small freezer, most of the storage in the refrigerator section, and it would have been a top mount freezer. And notice the color. We do have a bit of color here. And now this one. Now at this point we are talking about the luxury model refrigerator. Double door, huge, they list it as just 47 inches wide. It's like only 47 inches wide. 47 inches is almost four feet. When you consider that a modern cooking range on average is two and a half feet, 30 inches is standard. You realize how big that thing is. And notice it is pink. But do keep in mind, this would have been the top of the line. And take a look at the lower portion of this ad, where we have eight different pastel colors to choose from. Uh, it's interesting because they had a lot of colors, but just look at it. The colors are really not all that different from one another. Now, this is another double door refrigerator. And once again, as you saw in the last photo, we're looking at something that's only about five feet tall. 
and notice how much space is occupied by the side walls of the refrigerator and the freezer. Insulating technology was not great back then. And when you had a refrigerator, an unusually large portion of the overall machine was dedicated to keeping the cold air in. The walls and doors were very thick. So this is one of the reasons you will see something like this. And even though this is probably about as wide as a high-end double-door refrigerator today, the storage space is maybe half what you would get today. Now, let's talk about one of the innovations that came in in the 1950s, although, frankly, it really didn't catch on until somewhat later. And that was the ice maker. This is an automatic ice maker. Now, this one is not from the 1950s. As you can see, this is probably from the 1980s. It was a little machine inside your freezer that made ice cubes. Well, you had to pay extra for it. And the refrigerators were very expensive going into the game. So paying extra for an ice maker and paying a plumber to come in and run the water line over to your refrigerator, which might be on the other side of the room, this was expensive. Built-in ice makers were uh, a specialty item. People who used a great deal of ice loved them. People who did not use a great deal of ice saw themselves sacrificing 20, 25 to 30% of their freezer space for an ice maker. So, no, specialty item. It didn't catch on until this point. Now, in the mid-1960s, I think it was Frigidaire, came out with a through-the-door ice dispenser. This, by the way, is not that particular refrigerator. This is a later model. But refrigerator, refrigerators with ice makers that could be accessed without opening the freezer door was one of the things that made them popular. Also, at that point, we had really increased the size of our freezers to the point where giving up that uh, one, one and a half cubic feet of space to the ice maker was no longer such a big deal. But what we're looking at here is rather typical of what a 1960s freezer would look like, even though I believe this one is a little later. I believe this one is a late 60s, possibly early 70s. Instead of the rounded, curved angles we had in the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, suddenly things went back to being squared off. And if you'll recall, that was one of the key differences I pointed out between the refrigerators of the 20s and the refrigerators of the 30s. In the 20s, they were square. Um, you, could, you could use the top of your refrigerator the same way you used a dresser top in the 1920s. In the 1930s, nope, not happening, too rounded. By the 1960s, we went right back to square again. Also, the color wars. In the late 60s, and we discussed this when we discussed kitchens of the 1960s and early 70s, they were experimenting with color. The three colors that eventually uh, settled out as the winners were brown, yellow, and green. But we went through color wars to get there. Every manufacturer had their own version of brown, their own version of yellow, their own version of green. And what we're going to take a look at here, 1960s, early 70s, these are different versions of brown. Now, this one, as you can see, is a sort of orangey, terracotta-like brown. This one, whoa, that one's downright orange. Uh, we've got this one, which is more of a uh, a sort of light coffee color. And this one, which is bright red. The bright red color, by the way, was called poppy. 
and it is one of the colors in that brown range that actually had a bit of a life of its own. There were a few years when poppy appliances were big sellers, but quite frankly, living with red appliances in your kitchen is not something that was easily done, so it fell by the wayside very, very quickly. This picture is interesting for another reason. This is an ad, and I'm not sure who's advertising what. But as you can see, Grandma is sitting in front of her old refrigerator, looking at the new one, and she's looking askance at this giant thing going into her kitchen, and it's not going to fit. Notice the size difference between her old refrigerator and the new one. In the 1960s, refrigerators are becoming big. Um, this one is a refrigerator designed from the 1970s. Double door refrigerators were all the rage. And as a consequence, that is a style, uh, along with the top mount, that just took us from the 70s right through to the 1980s. So this, by the way, you're probably going to say, oh my goodness, this isn't 1980s because where is my oak? Where is my almond? This is a sub-zero refrigerator. Now, whoever bought that refrigerator may well have paid more for the refrigerator than they paid for their car. No kidding. Sub-zeros were just phenomenally expensive. They still are. It's a top brand. What happened in the 80s was that in addition to getting bigger, refrigerators got more built-in looking. And Sub-Zero led the way on this. Notice that the refrigerator is no longer protruding from beyond the countertop level, which is something that we had seen in the 50s and 60s. Generally speaking, uh, oh, the depth of your counter is about 25 inches. Generally speaking, the refrigerator depth was anywhere from 28 to 30. A refrigerator could literally be a tripping hazard. It would extend so far out from your countertop. Sub-Zero really led the way in building them in. And here's another thing Sub-Zero did. You not only built your refrigerator in, you covered it in wood panels. By the way, here are your 80s colors so that it blended in with your cabinetry. The refrigerator was now becoming invisible. Here, this is another one. This, by the way, is not Sub-Zero, like the last two, so you didn't have to take out a second mortgage to buy this one. I think this is a Frigidaire model. They were still expensive, but not obscenely so. And here, let's take a look at this. This is a Sub-Zero. Um, very, very high-end refrigerator in a very high-end kitchen. That is what a refrigerator looked like. It didn't catch on, and what happened was we got new colors. We got black, we got stainless steel, and we moved away from the almond of the 1980s over to white. Today, if you walk into a kitchen, you are more likely to see white, black, or stainless steel than anything else because we've, we've gotten rid of color. So let's take a look at where we are now. This is a high-end refrigerator. Once again, it's got a sort of integrated feel. It's, it's set back and it's no longer protruding extensively in front of the countertops. But there's no question that this is a refrigerator. Actually, there is a question that this is a refrigerator. I'm not sure what it looks like to me, but it doesn't really look like a refrigerator. To me, that looks like something that someone got from Star Trek. This is totally built into the wall. Just bang. They've, they've 
cut a hole in the wall and shoved the refrigerator. It is completely flush with that wall, um, presumably except for the handles. But to be honest with you, because of the picture, it's it's really hard for me to see. I believe those handles are standing somewhat proud of the refrigerator. That's it. That is refrigeration at its finest right now. So before we go, I want to take you back to what I said about those old refrigerators and the cubic foot storage of perhaps eight to 10 feet at most. In the 1980s, the average refrigerator size, in other words, the most popular model out there would have been 17 to 19 cubic feet. In the earlier 80s, it was 17 cubic feet. In the later 80s, it was 19 cubic feet. We were seeing 21 cubic foot refrigerators selling by the time we got into the 90s. Now they are saying that when you are buying a refrigerator, you should consider 20 to 24 cubic feet. Well, all I can say to that is we really need to rethink this. And there are a lot of reasons for this. First of all, if you are environmentally conscious, refrigeration is responsible for a very large chunk of our energy usage. And by that, I don't necessarily mean just your home refrigerator. I'm talking the big picture, the refrigeration used in the trucks to bring that refrigerated food to the refrigerated compartments in your grocery store. Refrigeration in general is huge. And you might be looking at your refrigerator saying, well, this only costs me $4 a month to run or whatever. Frankly, I don't know what the average is, but get that food to you in the first place. You've got the trucks and the stores and the, the warehouses and so on. So that head of lettuce has cost you a lot in terms of energy. We also need to look at the incredible amount of food waste we have in this country. We throw away half of what we buy. We really do. Um, and a lot of that is because these giant appliances are encouraging us to overbuy to begin with. Now, I am as guilty of this as anyone, and I tend to be very cautious about waste. But yeah, I, I just like everybody else, I'll go out, I'll get something, I'll forget I have it, and I have to throw it away at the end of the week. So I'm thinking that we could do ourselves and, you know, our environment and our community, et cetera, et cetera, a big favor if we scaled back on our refrigeration. If the next time we decided to buy a refrigerator, we went to a smaller size. Most of us could easily do it. Let's face it, our grandmothers were raised, raising huge families with those little eight cubic foot refrigerators, we could do it. It might take some changes. But I don't know about the rest of you. I'm certainly going to give it some thought because I have started to feel very guilty lately about the amount of perfectly good food I throw away, especially when I start to listen to working class families talking about the hardship that the current price increases are causing for them. It makes me feel guilty when I stop and think, yeah, and I threw away three bananas yesterday and geez, these people are wondering how they're going to feed their kids next week. Yeah, that's my mother, by the way. Yes, I know too much information. My mother would always lecture me if I threw away food about how many little children were starving in Korea. That was her thing, Korea. So maybe we should rethink this. I know I'm going to. 
Now, I hope you've enjoyed this tour of refrigeration. Next time, we are going to go off onto stoves. And I'm going to give you a little bitty preview right now. This is the ad for my personal stove. And yes, we are going to talk about Ezra, along with all of Ezra's fellow travelers, when we look at stoves next week. All right, for those of you who stay with us for just chatting, it'll be coming up at 8 o'clock this evening. For those of you who are strictly into the thrifting and vintage and project videos, we will be back next weekend. We're going to have a slideshow on our way out. And I hope you all have a terrific day. I will see you next time.